Okay, assalamu alaikum, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to welcome our uh, guests from, you know, the winners of King Faisal Prize uh, 2019. Uh, our faculty, our uh, colleagues, staff, members, students to uh, this talk. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure uh, to introduce to you on behalf of the university's administration and our dean, Dr. Khaled, uh, uh, our guest speaker, Professor Stephen Teitelbaum. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Teitelbaum was born in New York, and he received his bachelor degree from Columbia College in New York. Then he received his uh, MD degree from Washington University in St. Louis. He uh, progressed through academic ranks, and then he became a professor of uh, pathology, m immunology, and uh, medicine. Uh, professor Teitelbaum is well published. He published more than 340 articles in top journals, and he sat on the editorial board of many top-notch journals as well. Uh, he attained leadership positions in many professional organizations including the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research. And he won many international and national uh, awards. In 2019, he won King Faisal Prize for his work on bone uh, biology. And uh, in particular, he added to our knowledge on the uh, pathophysiology of bone diseases and their management, in particular, osteoporosis. He's a pioneer in uh, 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 highlighting the functions and regulations of osteoclasts. And uh, today's lecture is going to address that. He's going to talk to us today about osteoclast, its function, what does it do, and how. Please join me in welcoming Professor Teitelbaum. for them for their uh, okay. video recording. So this is here. for us to sure. be able to hear. You OK? Um, Put it here? Can it Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Keyboard to advance. Yes. Program. You know, I've been in this business for a long time. And they were great honors that can happen to somebody. And this is a great honor. It's something that I will remember and my children will remember, my grandchildren will remember. So I want to thank you very much, the King Faisal Prize Committee. I want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to my talk. I want to begin by showing you a picture of Washington University Medical Center, where I work. It is the largest medical center in the United States for a single medical school. And from a point of view of what we, let me just see. OK. We also have the largest musculoskeletal research center in the United States. Um, we have 80 investigators, very well funded. And it's a very exciting place to be. My career would not have been what it had been had it not been at this institution. And I want to invite all of you. If you're ever in the United States, in St. Louis, please come visit us. We'll be glad to show you what we do. So I'm going to talk to you today about osteoclasts. I've spent my life studying them. And they actually have led me to study a number of other aspects of science, because science takes you to places you don't know you're going to be. But what my goal is today is to tell you about how osteoclasts generally work and what are the therapeutic implications of these cells and controlling them. So these are osteoclasts. I'm sorry, is there a pointer here? 
Oh, I can use this, I guess. Okay, got it, okay. These are osteoclasts. They're multinucleated giant cells, and they're the principal, if not exclusive, cell that resorbs or degrades bone in the body. The implications of this cell are vast, not only in my country, but in yours. Osteoporosis is very common. Approximately 50% of women reaching the age of 65 in the United States and Saudi Arabia will develop an osteoporotic fracture. The fractures are, particularly in women, vertebral, wrist fracture in young individuals, and they develop a wrist fracture because they fall this way, they still have proprioception and hip fracture, which is the most devastating fracture of all. And it's devastating because 20% of patients who develop a hip fracture will die within a year. So this is a potentially fatal condition and one that we have to address. Now the amount of bone that we have is dictated principally by two cells, osteoblasts which form bone and osteoclasts which resorb them. And regardless of the cause of osteoporosis, whoops, I did something bad boy here. Okay, am I a good boy now? Okay. Regardless of the cause of osteoporosis, it always represents an enhancement of the activity of bone resorbing cells relative to bone forming cells. Now, I'm going to talk about the osteoclast and osteoporosis, but I want to leave you with a message about how rare diseases can tell us about common diseases. And the disease that has taught us most about how the osteoclast works is a disease known as osteopetrosis or marble bone disease. And this is an x-ray of a child with osteopetrosis. You can see that it has this ivory appearance to it and that is because it has, it has a massive increase in bone mass. Now, there are two ways that one can increase bone mass. You can either stimulate osteoblasts or you can inhibit osteoclasts. And by definition, osteopetrosis is a family of disorders in which the number and or the function of osteoclasts is disrupted which leads to an accumulation of bone. Now, from a clinical perspective, it's a spectrum. But basically, there are two peaks in the, in the clinical distribution of this disease. One which we'll spend most time on is a malignant form of the disease, which is an, principally an autosomal recessive. And then there is a benign form of the disease, which is probably much more common than we appreciate, because it's, be, it's benign. And that is an autosomal dominant. Malignant osteopetrosis, as I said, is inherited as an autosomal recessive. Patients have a dense sclerotic skeleton. Because of replacement or, or displacement of the bone marrow, they develop severe hematologic abnormalities, and they develop neurological abnormalities because of brain compression and nerve compression, cranial nerve compression, due to the excess bone. And until the example that I'm going to show you, these children died invariably in early childhood, principally in the first decade. Now, this is the child that changed my career. It happened early in my career, and this little girl has malignant osteopetrosis. You see that she has massive hepatosplenomegaly because of extra, extra medullary hematopoiesis and she was going blind, and she was going to die. At that time, my colleagues and I had a theory about the autogeny of the osteoclast. We posited that it was of hematopoietic origin, and we reasoned then that if we gave this girl new healthy marrow, we would be giving her new osteoclast precursors and we may be able to help her. This is what happened. She had a brother who was, eight, who was uh, immunologically identical, and so he took the marrow from a little brother, did a marrow transplant, 
And there were seven weeks you could see this dramatic change. 22 weeks, even more. The most exciting thing of all is this little girl when she was three and a half years old. That's not the whole story. This is when she graduated from college. She's alive and well today. Now, those of us who become physicians, particularly academic physicians, have the opportunity to study diseases that are non, not, not, not defined. But I will tell you, in my professional career, this was the most moving experience of my life. But it was not only a moving experience from an emotional point of view, it also was a moving experience intellectually. Because it gave us the opportunity to ask the question, what is the osteoclast precursor? Now you'll remember, this is a male transplant, a male graft into a female. And what that enabled us to do is to follow the Y chromosome. And the reason that this was important is because at this time, there was a controversy about what the osteoclast precursor was. Was it a hematopoietic precursor, as we had posited? Or was it a stromal cell, as others had posited? The stromal cell is the precursor of the osteoblast. Uh, these the people who, who bought into that aspect of it thought that the osteoblast and the osteoclast had a common precursor. So again, what we were able to do was to ask whether or not this little girl's osteoclast had a Y or male chromosome. Of course, if it did, they did, that would establish that the osteoclast is of hematopoietic origin because it came from the male graft. In those days, there were not the kind of sophistication that we have today in genetics, but we were able to identify the male chromosome morphologically. And in this complex slide, I just want to call your attention to two lines. The bottom line is, what this is about is what cells have the Y chromosome, the male chromosome, prior to and following transplantation. So if we look at the osteoblasts, and the bottom line right here, as you'd expect in this little girl, none of her osteoblasts had the Y chromosome, nor did they after transplantation. We look at the osteoclast again, as we would expect, prior to transplantation, none of our osteoclasts had the Y chromosome. Following transplantation, we could identify it in an abundance of our osteoclasts. So this experiment in nature established that the osteoclast is, in fact, of hematopoietic origin. This opened up the door to a host of experimental uh, uh, events, excuse me, which define the osteoclast precursor. And we now know that the osteoclast precursor is a member of the myeloid macrophage family. It arises in the marrow, it circulates, and it attaches to bone. And the attachment to bone is a very important event because signals come out of the bone matrix into the osteoclast which leads to its multinucleation and the development of the capacity to degrade bone. So this then, since we, were, we knew it was from the, from the macrophage, it enabled us to ask the question, how are osteoclasts generated? That is, how does the macrophage become an osteoclast? Now, an important experiment was done in Japan, which showed that if the macrophage is to become an osteoclast, it had to be in physical contact with members of the stromal cell, mesenchymal stromal cells. That the mesenchymal stromal cells had the capacity to push the precursor cell to become an osteoclast. So that meant that there was a molecule 
on the surface of the stromal cell, which acted, in, interacted with a receptor on the macrophage, which would promote osteo, uh, osteoclast formation. Now, what I'm going to show you now is something that I have great pride in. Because this may be the most important series of studies that have been done to define how the osteoclast resorbs bone. And it was done by my postdoc, David Lacey, when he became vice president for research at Amgen. So for those of you who are new in academics, let me just say that the biggest thrill that you'll have in your life is the success of your trainees, more than your own. And this was one of them. So what David did, <clears throat> he made a mouse. And the mouse, as you can see here on the right, has severe osteopetrosis. And the mouse overexpressed a molecule subsequently called osteoprotogerin, or OPG. And what osteoprotogerin does, it functions as a decoy receptor. That is, it circulates. And when it circulates, it binds to this molecule here on the surface of the stromal cell, prevents its interaction with the receptor, and pre thereby prevents osteopro osteo uh, osteoclast generation. It turns out that this molecule on the surface of the cell proves to be rank li a molecule known as rank ligand, a member of the tumor necrosis factor superfamily. This is the most important molecule in the development of the osteoclast, and in fact, in its activation. Now, how is this proven? Well, what David did was to make a rank ligand, a rank, ligand, a rank knockout mouse. Rank is the receptor. And you can see here, that that's what a wild type mouse looks like. This is what the rank, knockout, rank ligand knockout mouse looks like. And you can see it has severe osteopetrosis. So we now know, if we look, if we have the scheme of how the osteoclast is formed, rank ligand is central to the differentiation of the osteoclast precursor, the monocyte macrophage, into the bone resorptive cell. There's another molecule that's important that I don't have time to talk to you about, and that's macrophage colony stimulating factor. What this molecule does is it promotes the proliferation of the macrophage precursors and therefore increases the capacity to generate osteoclasts. And if we take rank ligand and macrophage colony stimulating factor, and we take macrophages and we put them in culture, we can make lots of osteoclasts. Now, once we were able to do that, we were able to go after the mechanism by which the osteoclast resorbs bone. <clears throat> now, what I've talked to you about is osteoclast abundance. That is, there are two basic mechanisms which dictate the amount of bone that's formed. First is abundance. You get more osteoclasts, you get more bone resorption. And rank ligand increases the number of osteoclasts. The other mechanism is function of the osteoclast. That is, how deep a pit, how deep a hole will the osteoclast resorb? How much bone will it degrade? So you can modulate bone resorption by either modulating the number of osteoclasts or the capacity of the individual osteoclasts to resorb bone. So how does the osteoclast degrade bone? Well, an important observation was made that the osteoclast, whenever it degrades bone, it sticks to the surface of the bone, hunkers right down on the surface of the bone. And what was so interesting is what it does in the little space between itself and the bone surface, that's where resorption takes place, it markedly diminishes pH. It acidifies this, this environment. And so we thought that this was probably an important phenomenon. And so we identified the, 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 the proton pump, if you will. It's called an electrogenic proton pump, or the ATPase. And we identified it 
and we basically took it apart, looking at the components of the proton pump and the osteoclast. And so we define pretty much how the osteoclast uses the proton pump to resorb bone. What's the physiological implications? Again, we come back to osteopetrosis. A mutation in this proton pump is one of the, if not the most common mutation in children with severe osteopetrosis. So by identifying the physiology, the mechanism, we're able to lead to, to, to a system in which we could identify the, um, uh, the causative effects on, uh, on bone form resorption. And so let's put the proton pump over here in the resorptive aspect of the cell. It doesn't affect its number, but it affects its ability to resorb bone. Now, if you transport protons into that space, you've got to make them. And the way in which a cell makes protons is by using the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And so basically what happens is the cell takes water and carbon dioxide and, uh, and, and forms bicarbonate ions, HC, HCO3 minus, and protons. And the protons then are transported out of the cell. This is a family that my colleague Michael White had followed for a number of years with benign osteopetrosis. See, there's a mom and there's a dad, and there are four sisters. And you can tell who has the osteopetrosis. Three of the four sisters have the osteopetrosis. Those are the ones that are shorter. And what Michael did is he discovered that the cause of this osteopetrosis is, in fact, a mutation in carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase then becomes a component of the resorptive mechanism of the osteoclast. So where does that leave us? We've got the protons coming out of the cell and the bicarbonate ions staying behind. Well, bicarbonate ions increase the intracellular pH. So the cell is obligated to get rid of those bicarbonate ions that it has that are accumulating in the face of the, of the ion transport out of the cell, proton transport. And so what happens to that residual, that increase in bicarbonate ions? Well, it turns out that there is an energy-independent transporter, an anionic transporter on the osteoclast that exchanges bicarbonate ions for chloride ions. And again, does this have physiological relevance? Turns out that the chloride bicarbonate exchanger, when it's mutated, causes osteopetrosis, the gold standard. So let's put the bicarbonate chloride exchanger in the package that leads to bone resorption. That again left another problem. What happened to the chloride ion? Chloride ions will increase in the cell changes the, 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 electro, the electrophysiology of the cell, what happens? Well, we postulated that what was going on here is that there was a channel in the osteoclast. And the osteoclast would transport this chloride ion out of the channel into the space with the protons. And basically, what the cell was doing was producing hydrochloric acid, which drives the pH down to about 4.5, which is the pH of lysosomes, <laughs> in this space here. And indeed, yes, we were able to identify the chloride channel in the cell. And the big hit here is that the chloride channel is the most common cause of benign osteopetrosis in man, a mutation of the chloride channel. <clears throat> so the chloride channel then becomes, again, a component of this resorptive process. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, bone consists excuse me, of mineral and organic matrix. And what I've shown you is acidification as a mechanism by which the osteoclast resorbs bone. And if you take a piece of bone and you drop it in acid, you'll take the mineral out. 
but it won't do anything to the other component of bone, because bone consists of mineral and organic matrix, and the organic matrix is largely collagen. And so with the realization that this resorption of space here was acidified, we postulated that there was a molecule probably produced by lysosomes, which are acidified, an enzyme, which would degrade the organic or collagenous component of bone. So how does organic matrix resorption work? What we did was to first ask, what is the pH optimum of osteoclast mediated degradation? And you'll note that it's about 4.5, which is exactly the pH in that resorptive space that I talked to you about. And it turns out that the enzyme that is responsible for that is a lysosomal enzyme called cathepsin K. So what happens is the osteoclast removes the mineral from the bone, exposes the organic matrix, removes the mineral by acidification, exposes the organic matrix, and then the cathepsin K is secreted into that space, leading to, um, leading to organic matrix degradation. Does this cause uh, this is cause disease. Anybody know who this is? Anybody here of Toulouse-Lautrec? This is Toulouse-Lautrec. Toulouse-Lautrec, very famous 19th century French painter. He had a disease known as pycnodysostosis. Pycnodysostosis is a form of osteopetrosis, which is due to the inability to make enough cathepsin K or a mutation in cathepsin K, which prevents the uh, enzyme from working and the bone accumulates. So cathepsin K becomes a critical component of the capacity of the osteoclast to resorb bone. So this is what we're looking at. This is basically the mechanism by which the osteoclast works. Talk to you about the fact that it, be, it acidifies this microenvironment, leads to the mobilization of mineral, exposes the organic matrix, and then cathepsin K comes in and degrades the organic matrix. So we've done a lot of work on this, not me, the field. Um, my partner, to, uh, uh, Bjorn Olsen, who is the, my co-laureate, has made enormous contributions to this field. And so I'm not talking about Steve Teitelbaum's lab now, I'm talking about the field. So what are the therapeutic results of osteoclast science. Whoops. So, let me go back. So these then became, in many people's eyes, therapeutic targets. And the first therapeutic target that people thought about was rank ligand, because it's such a central molecule to the development of, of, of osteoclast function. And to this end, again, this was my postdoc, David Lacey, who developed a rank ligand inhibitor. It's an anti-rank ligand monoclonal antibody, and it's known as the nosumab. Prolia is the, is, the, uh, is the commercial name for it, and it is a, a drug that is used very, very effectively in osteoporosis and other diseases. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So how does the nosumab work? It blocks rank ligand. It basically removes it from the circulation. This, in turn, leads to a rest of the capacity of the macrophage to become an osteoclast. Denosumab, as I said, is used in postmenopausal women uh, with low bone density. And it's also used in rheumatoid arthritis. Why would it be used in rheumatoid arthritis? Well, you know, you know that the joints of patients with RA are destroyed. They're inflamed and they're destroyed. Why are they destroyed? What happens is the inflammatory tissue in rheumatoid arthritis leads to the recruitment of inflammatory cytokines. One of them is rank ligand, and rank ligand is effective in patients with RA, and let me show you the data. 
So this is change in bone erosion in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This line, the, the, the line of them up here are the untreated patients. These are patients who received rank ligand at two different doses. So as you can see, it has dramatic effect on uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Cathepsin K, is that important? Well, Merck developed a cathepsin K inhibitor, which is very effective in preventing osteoporosis, extremely effective. Unfortunately, um, for reasons that we don't know, they've walked away from the, from the compound, from the drug, but my, my guess is that this kind of strategy will, in fact, lead to uh, development of an anti, uh, of an anti using a cathepsin K inhibitor. Now, I want to leave you with a feel, uh, a, a, a series of observations that you may not know about. And that is the role of the osteoclast in skeletal metastasis. And if we look at the incidence of skeletal metastasis in patients with advanced breast cancer in particular and prostate cancer, it's extremely high. In fact, bone, I'm talking about bone metastasis, bone is the number one metastatic target for patients with advanced breast cancer. And what are the complications? Well, people with breast cancer, women with breast cancer, can live pretty long lives. I've had many of them live more than 10 years. The problem is they fracture. So can we, is there anything that the osteoclast is doing here that will enable us to help women who have metastatic breast cancer resist fracture? This is an image of a woman with metastatic breast cancer in the humerus. It has an osteolytic appearance to it. And the osteolytic appearance suggests that the reason that they're losing bone is the bone is being resorbed. Now, there are two possibilities. One is, that most people thought, that's the, bre that's the cancer itself that's resorbing the bone. And the other possibility is that the cancer is recruiting cells to the lesion, which leads to bone resorption. And it's the latter that turns out to be true. So what we're looking at here is a histological section of metastatic breast cancer. The, these cells are the tumor, and these red cells here are the osteoclasts. So what happens is the tumor recruits the osteoclast to the bone. The osteoclast resorb the bone, get the hole that I just showed you, and that leads to, the, uh, to fractures. The logical consequence of this is, the therapeutic consequence is, can we prevent this by blocking the osteoclast? So let's look at the incidence of breast cancer fractures using different inhibitors of the osteoclast. Within a two-year period, a woman with metastatic breast cancer to the bone untreated, has a, two, has a two thirds risk of developing a fracture. If we treat her with one inhibitor, and this I'm not, I haven't talked to you about bisphosphonates, just to, but it's the most common drug that we use to inhibit osteoclasts, it, it goes down by about a third. If we treat her with another inhibitor, goes down more, and if we treat her with a rank ligand inhibitor, it's down by two-thirds. Pretty remarkable, huh? This has had an enormous impact on the lifestyle of women who have metastatic cancer. Now, I want to talk to you about another area that our center focuses on. We have the largest Shriners Hospital in the country. You may not know that, are they coming here to take me away? <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they have, um, we have the largest Shriners Hospital in the country, and Shriners Hospitals focus on crippled kids. And one of the most common diseases that you see of crippled kids 
is osteogenesis imperfecta, or brittle bone disease. This is a devastating disease. I mean, you can see, look at this little kid here, and you can see how devastating it is. What happens if we treat these kids with anti-osteoclast drugs? This is one example, the same kid. After three years, you can see there's a marked increase in the density of her vertebrae. This is more important. These are seven kids with osteogenesis imperfecta. This is the number of fractures they had experienced before they were started to tr be treated with an anti-resorptive drug. That's what happens. Again, another terrific, you know, this is what makes life great. So I want to leave you now with uh, a cartoon that gives you probably 10% of the molecular mechanisms that have been discovered in my lab and other labs uh, that lead to the formation and the, uh, uh, the regular formation and, uh, and function of osteoclasts. The red ones were either uh, uh, drugs that have been developed, ta drug targets have been developed, or potential drug targets. But there's many, many more in the pot. This is the most important slide of all. This is the one I'm most proud of. These are my trainees. And I said to you before, having great trainees, watching the, your young people develop into good people, people who make contributions, it's the best thing in the world. It's a lot better than publishing papers, believe me. And. Uh, that's who paid the bills, the NIH, the Shriners Hospital. And we did some cancer studies, which was, public, was, was, uh, was um, uh, paid for by the Cancer Center at Washington University. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I hope this was clear. Professor, uh, for an eye-opener, enlightening, exciting talk. Thank you. Uh, we'll open the floor for a few questions, if you may. Yes. I, I have one uh, fascinating talk, uh, but uh, 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 the talk is basically uh, you, were, you were dealing with the um, osteoclast mechanism for that osteoporosis. What about the other story of the estrogen? That, yes. You know, how, how do they right. uh, mimic? Well, estrogen was a very effective therapy for women with osteoporosis. The problem is that women don't want to take it because of the predisposition to breast cancer. We have a real problem in getting women to accept anti-osteoporosis therapy because there are, the estrogen story makes sense, but there are other stories that are, are just anecdotal, and so we have a real difficulty. Estrogens do inhibit the osteoclast. That's how they work. I think what you're asking me, and correct me if I'm misquoting you, is are there, is there another strategy here, for example, the osteoblast? And indeed there is. There is a, uh, a drug known as teriparatide, or for tail. It's parathyroid hormone, 1 to 34. It is very, very effective in stimulating bone formation. There's a, a variety of these drugs that will be coming out in the next year or two. And this is very important because in certain circumstances, when you inhibit resorption, you also inhibit formation. And so you want a circumstance in which you're not inhibiting formation, but you're blocking resorption. But you're right on target about, about estrogen. This was, when I started this, in this business, that was standard therapy. Thank you, I'm touched. Uh, you know, uh, as uh, the macrophage develops and proliferates into uh, osteoclasts, we know that these osteoclasts are <coughs> multiple nuclei. Some of them can have as many as 50 nuclei. Correct. Is there any significance to the number yes. of nuclei? Yes. And First, I'm sorry. We always thought that when you increase the osteoclastic activity, you also increase the osteoclastic That's correct. Uh, that is correct. And so the, what happens under disease states? Is there a change? That's what, 
your colleague, the question he asked was exactly that. It's the balance. Tech for tail. It, it stimulates the osteoblast and it stimulates the osteoclast. But it stimulates the osteoblast more than it stimulates the osteoclast. But my friend, you're right on target. There is this what we call coupling event. I just don't have time to talk to you about it, but it's an important one, in which the osteoclast and the osteoblast talk to each other. And you have to be sure that when you're treating patients, your, 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 your osteoblast stimulatory effect is greater than your osteoclast inhibitory effect. What about the nuclei? Yes. So the nuclei, multinucleated cell, they, it occurs by fusion. It's not division of the nuclei. And there is a relationship between the size of the osteoclast and its ability to resorb bone. The best example is Paget's disease of bone. The way you make the diagnosis histologically of Paget's disease of bone is the appearance of the osteoclast. These are big guys, 50 nuclei, as you just pointed out. But you're absolutely right. There is a direct correlation between osteoclast size and the ability of the osteoclast to resolve both. Yes? Excellent presentation. Thank I just you. was curious about the mechanism. You were showing that, you know, uh, acidic media is basically secreted in the area where the bone resorption is happening. So can we use the uh, proton pump inhibitors to treat osteoporosis? Yes. Um, there was a company in Switzerland, in Sweden, that does exactly that. That's one of the targets. Exactly. Yeah. Yes? So it was in addition to that, but at the same point, I can just say proton pump blockers increase the risk of osteoporosis. Of what? Proton pump blockers uh, increase the risk of osteoporosis. There's the proton a proton blocker. Well, it has, it's interesting. Well, it's interesting. We've known all, but we've known about the proton pump for a long, long time. And companies became very interested in it, but they never developed it. And it may be due to what you just talked about, that the side effects of the proton pump inhibitors are such that uh, you can't use them. But they, you're, you're, you're right on target. There is a, um, uh, there, is a, a there has been a emphasis on using it, but it has not yet worked. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you touched upon uh, the requirements of the rank ligand. Um, and essentially, the importance of the rank ligand uh, comes from the calcium signaling mechanism that it induces uh, there eventually. It's just interesting you mentioned how tumor cells seem to uh, employ the same mechanism to recruit uh, these osteoclasts in the bone. So my question is really two parts. Um, First of all, wouldn't it be better to, for therapeutic targets uh, to target this calcium signaling pathway? Because that's probably what's involved in remodeling uh, and during the differentiation. Um, and second, does the tumor recruitment, does that involve a similar mechanism to rank um, Yes. Does that involve calcium? Yes, the tumor, tumors, not all of them, perhaps not most of them, make rank ligand. They make a variety of other parathyroid hormone-related proteins. Um, so yes, they do that. I'm sorry, the other question was? The, the other uh, as well. Then, oh yes, the signaling mechanism. And, and so, uh, just as an add-on, sorry, um, with the estrogen, estrogen is also quite heavily involved in calcium. Disease. Correct. So I was just wondering whether there is an uh, uninvestigated aspect. Yes, well, there are now calcium, ca cha calcium channel blockers that are used in a variety, hypertension, for example. They have not shown to be effective in inhibiting the osteoclast. There is one target, however, and my lab is working on it now. It's an epigenetic target. Uh, the key transcription factor in this process is called NFATC1. That's the major downstream target. And this has become now a, a, a potential clinical target, not only rank ligand, but the downstream signaling event. Yes, uh, just like one of the 
most troubled maker, basically, is just the monocytes in terms of their differentiation. I mean, they differentiate into foam cells. Um, right. For instance, they instead of going from three days lifespan to basically immortalized. My thing, I know you're trying to, to, to block the formation of the flux, but what about clearing that? I mean, what's yeah, that? you mean the precursor. Yeah, it's complex. And the reason it's complex is the point that you just made. Within the last 10 years, we've discovered how, um, how important or how diverse macrophage function is. And um, for example, we now have a, a paper that we've just submitted in which we take a, one gene out of myeloid lineage cells in a mouse, one gene, put it on a high fat diet and, if you, and it gains zero weight. Zero weight. And we have worked at the mechanism. It has to do with energy expenditure. I think you're right on. It's complex, and it's becoming more complex. Talking about macrophages as macrophages no longer makes sense. They are a com it's a complex family of cells. What, what about clearing them? Have you looked into terms of like clearing the osteoclast? Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, inhibiting I mean, rankle ligand mean, clears the osteoclast. Denosumab does exactly that. It decreases the abundance of the osteoclast. Do we have room for two more questions? Is there, uh, a simple question. I, I'm a chemist, but I would like to ask about these uh, signaling molecules produced by the bones and their impact on the brain health and the immune system. Yeah. So this is a field that has been uh, <coughs> pioneered by Gerard Carsenti. And uh, his hypothesis is that the, um, uh, the osteoclast produces a molecule known as osteocalcin. And osteocalcin then feeds back and regulates the metabolic syndrome, and it also regulates the immune system as well. We've been working on that. We've been working on it in the context of obesity, the relationship of obesity to, uh, to bone disease, because patients who are obese have a very complex skeletal phenotype. And we've been doing that right now as we, as we speak. So yes, this is hot stuff. Gerard has made major contributions. But it is not yet, it is not yet um, nailed. You know, for example, one of the things that we did recently is make a mouse with no fat, zero fat. Bone mass goes up sixfold. So in some way, bone mat, fat is talking to bone. I guess what I'm talking about here for the younger people is the excitement of science is where it is the unexpected. One of the most difficult things I have in my lab is my a trainer will come to me and say, the experiment didn't work. And I'll say, that's great news. That's not bad news. You know, if the experiment works, it's boring. And so this is, uh, I think that what you're talking about is right on. This is brand new stuff. And we make a human with zero fat, I'd be interested. <laughs> well, actually, we're patenting it. So <laughs> I'll let you know if we get the patent. <laughs> Rank ligand inhibitors? Yes. Yeah. Yes, the, the nosomab that I showed you. It's the most effective means that we have now. <laughs> they don't, are you asking, does it, does, it, does it inhibit tumor growth? Does it inhibit tumors? We have no evidence that it inhibit tumors. No, rank ligand inhibitors working on actually the, uh, you mentioned them in the context of the benign osteoporosis. Were they used? No, no, rank ligand inhibitors were used in the context of osteoporosis, osteoporosis right. in, 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 uh, in tumors, right? In terms, actually, of the, of the tumors, you mentioned that there was less number of the collagen fractures in the tumors. A reduction. Yeah. Reduction. Yeah. 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 Were there also uh, reduction in the number of metastasis? No. One thing that we have not established is that these agents decrease or arrest metastatic disease. What, we, what has been established, that it will arrest the complications, the skeletal complications of metastatic disease. So there will be metastasis, but it will not be. Right, correct. 
does not does not fracture. Our last question, Mr. Mahmoud, and then we're going to have some close. Thank you very much for the presentation. I want to ask, is there a benefit, a benefit for patients with chronic mutations? I'm sorry, say again. Mutations with, with, with yeah, okay, chloride channel, they have osteopetrosis, yeah. and they have osteoclasts that don't work. Yeah. Ranked ligand would just add to the osteopetrosis. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much oh, again, you. Professor Tyson. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you. Well, thank you, job. ladies and gentlemen. Thank this was you. really, I really enjoyed this. The questions were, the questions were great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so thank much. You.